Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we're delving into another tragic case where greed, envy, and the lure of easy wealth drive individuals to commit unspeakable crimes. It's truly astonishing how some people can stoop to unimaginable lows in pursuit of quick riches. Take, for instance, the chilling tale of Elizabeth Vasquez. Elizabeth, a kind and industrious woman, devoted her life to her family's well-being, especially her beloved daughter, whom she tirelessly provided for, ensuring she received the best education possible. However, the unthinkable occurred when greed consumed Elizabeth's niece, along with her boyfriend. Their actions plunged this once prosperous family into a nightmare that horrified the public and captivated the media for years. In trying to fathom how a monstrous act like matricide could arise within a seemingly happy and affluent household, we delve into Elizabeth's family background. Born in 1967 in the town of Caham Mara, northwestern Peru, Elizabeth was the eldest of six children born to Ernesto Vasquez and Maria Moila. Her parents, earnest and hardworking individuals, toiled tirelessly to support their large family ensuring they had the means for education and a shot at a better future. The Vasquez family exuded warmth and happiness, with Elizabeth stepping up from a young age to assist her mother in caring for her younger siblings. Excelling academically, she graduated with honors, gaining admission to the prestigious university's law and economics faculty. It was there that she crossed paths with Alejandro Mendez Espino, a standout student in the field of law. Their connection blossomed into a whirlwind romance, leading to their official union in 1987, even before completing their studies. Elizabeth's parents embraced Alejandro wholeheartedly, recognizing his seriousness, intelligence, ambition, and ability to care for their daughter. Initially residing in the Vasquez family home, the couple ventured out on their own after six months when Elizabeth became pregnant. Their daughter, Elita, arrived in 1988, becoming the focal point of attention and joy for their extensive family. As their careers flourished, the couple made the decision to relocate to Lima, Peru's capital. Alejandro pursued a prosecutor position in an anti-corruption department, while Elizabeth established her own legal consulting firm. Despite their professional success, they found it challenging to devote ample time to their young daughter. Facing disappointment with hired help, Elizabeth opted to entrust Elita's care to her parents in Kayara. Maria and Ernesto welcomed their granddaughter with open arms, delighted to have her company. Notably, Alita's aunt, Giovanna, just a few years older, formed a sisterly bond with her. With their demanding careers consuming much of their time, Elizabeth and Alejandro found themselves distanced from their daughter. Compensating for their absence, Elizabeth and Alejandro showered Alita with gifts during her visits to her grandparents' home, extending over several years. By the time her parents decided to bring her back to their bustling home in Lima, Alita had already begun her schooling. Transitioning from the serene setting of Kayara to the noisy capital proved challenging for the young girl. Alita, once a quiet and well-behaved child, excelled academically and showed interest in music and languages. Her parents, aware of the years of separation, aimed to not only parent her, but also be her confidants. However, as Alita entered her teenage years, her demeanor shifted dramatically. She became disrespectful, prone to tantrums, and disregarded her studies, falling in with a troublesome crowd and even resorting to stealing from her parents. Despite Elizabeth's efforts to bridge the growing divide, Alita's behavior worsened. Arguments often erupted between mother and daughter, with Alejandro typically staying neutral, occasionally siding with Alita. This dynamic deeply wounded Elizabeth, especially as she saw Alita's insecurities about her appearance and subsequent requests for plastic surgery. Eager to mend their relationship, Elizabeth funded Alita's initial rhinoplasty, and subsequent surgeries. By 2007, after two decades of marriage, the strain within the family had become palpable. Upon deciding to part ways, Alejandro and Elizabeth faced an intense reaction from their 18-year-old daughter, 
marked by a historical outburst. She directed her anger and blame it toward her mother for the dissolution of their family unit. Despite the complications of navigating a divorce as citizens of another country while residing in the United States, they returned home as individuals, commencing separate lives by mutual consent. Their adult daughter, though still reliant on her parents, chose to remain in her mother's residence. However, the household was fraught with fierce arguments, often prompting Alita to reach out to her father in tears, pleading for him to intervene. Yet, Alejandro, now involved in a new relationship, hesitated to accommodate her requests, urging Alita instead to reconcile with her mother and await the time when she could forge her own path after completing her university education. Despite her declining academic performance and concerning behavior, Alita's parents were resolute in securing her enrollment in one of Peru's esteemed law faculties. Recognizing the significance of education, they spared no expense for their only child, Alita. Additionally, Alita found herself entangled with an unreliable boyfriend amidst the turmoil. In her teenage years, Alita experienced various romantic relationships, but it wasn't until she turned 19 that she found herself deeply enamored. This infatuation ignited one Sunday morning at church when she encountered Fernando Gonzalez, a charming young man who couldn't seem to divert his gaze from her during the service. Following the gathering, Fernando approached Alita, introducing himself with an air of charm and charisma. With his handsome appearance and attentive demeanor, he quickly captured her interest, inviting her for coffee and conversation. However, Alita soon discovered that Fernando had a penchant for targeting young, well-dressed girls at churches, particularly those who arrived in luxury cars. He would engage them in conversation, weaving tales of his troubled upbringing in a large fatherless family claiming to support his mother, siblings, and himself through multiple jobs, he skillfully elicited sympathy from his affluent acquaintances, sometimes even receiving financial assistance from them. Despite briefly sustaining a relationship with a wealthy girlfriend, Fernando's true colors as an unemployed freeloader always surfaced, leading to their eventual departure. Alita, grappling with her own insecurities, readily fell into Fernando's manipulative web. Believing herself unattractive, she was astounded by Fernando's attention and readily gave him everything she had, which in reality meant everything her mother possessed. Alita's newfound openness about her relationship with Fernando sparked the first candid conversation she'd had with her mother in years. Elizabeth, hopeful for reconciliation, welcomed Fernando initially, swayed by his captivating tales of hardship she even went so far as to provide him with a cozy apartment near central Lima and cover the majority of his expenses, including business school tuition, with promises of a future job in her company. However, Fernando's gratitude was short-lived. He displayed little interest in his studies or work, preferring instead to enjoy a lavish lifestyle at Alita's expense. Despite Elizabeth's attempts to give him chances, Fernando's behavior only worsened. It became evident that his intentions were solely to exploit Alita and her mother's generosity. As tensions escalated, Elizabeth, recognizing Fernando's manipulation, forbade Alita from seeing him, igniting her daughter's fury and defiance. Despite attempts to separate them by sending Alita to her grandparents' home, the bond between Alita and Fernando persisted, fueled by Alita's financial freedom and her refusal to heed her mother's warnings. Despite Elizabeth's hopes for a cooling-off period, Alita's resentment grew, and Fernando continued to exploit her financial resources, leading to a deeply fractured relationship between mother and daughter. As the summer break came to an end and university resumed, Alita wasted no time in meeting her boyfriend, who once again sought financial assistance from her. Despite the serious confrontation it sparked with her mother later that evening upon the discovery of missing funds, Alita remained undeterred. In response, Elizabeth decided to limit Alita's access to her accounts, providing her with only a small weekly allowance for personal expenses. This decision further strained their already tense relationship, leaving them mostly engaged in arguments with unsuccessful attempts at reconciliation. During a heated exchange, Fernando, frustrated by Alita's inability to provide him with the money he demanded, voiced a sinister idea. He insinuated that if Elizabeth were to vanish, adult Alita would inherit her substantial wealth, 
enabling them to live a life of luxury. This notion took hold in Alita's mind, fueling her resentment toward her mother and leading to fantasies of her disappearance. The young couple began concocting a chilling plan to eliminate Elizabeth, contemplating potential accomplices. At the time, Elizabeth possessed significant assets, including nearly $3 million in her accounts, a successful business, a sizable home in an elite area, several cars, and substantial life insurance. Sensing the looming danger and unable to sever Alita's ties with the manipulative Fernando Elizabeth, an experienced lawyer, took precautions. She drafted a will ensuring her assets would go to her father in the event of her sudden disappearance or untimely death, even confiding in her parents about her concerns. Meanwhile, Alita devised a scheme to stage her mother's kidnapping and murder, implicating supposed criminals in the act. The situation grew increasingly perilous, with Elizabeth recognizing the gravity of the threat posed by her daughter's disturbing plan. In a chilling turn of events, Alida and Fernando conspired to involve a tough character, Jorge Carnero Ruiz, in their sinister plan, promising him generous compensation for his services. Without hesitation, Jorge accepted the offer, despite the heinous nature of the crime, even against his own mother. On January 24, 2010, 21-year-old Alita met with her 23-year-old boyfriend to finalize the details of their scheme, envisioning the millions she would inherit. The following day, January 25th, under the guise of illness, Alita remained at home while her mother left for work. Meanwhile, Fernando and Jorge waited outside, ready to execute their plan. Alita cleverly distracted the guard on duty, allowing Fernando and Jorge to sneak into the house and hide in the master bedroom. As Elizabeth returned home, Alita deliberately made a noise in the kitchen to signal the attackers. When Elizabeth entered her room, Fernando attacked her, attempting to choke her while Jorge restrained her. In a miraculous turn, Elizabeth managed to break free and flee into the hallway, only to be kicked in the head by her own daughter, rendering her unconscious. The assailants then tied her up, intending to extract information about the safe code and bank account passwords. However, their plans were disrupted by a young servant girl, Maria Celine, whom Alita deceived and locked away in another room. Upon regaining consciousness, Elizabeth endured brutal torture at the hands of her daughter, boyfriend, and their accomplice as they ruthlessly sought the information they desired. Terrified and betrayed, Elizabeth finally realized the monstrous nature of her daughter's actions, recognizing the influence of Fernando on Alita. Despite her efforts to loosen, in a desperate struggle, Elizabeth managed to break free from her restraints and fought back against her daughter, resorting to scratching and punching until Fernando intervened, knocking her to the ground. Enraged, Alita viciously kicked her mother, and in a fit of rage, grabbed a pillow, suffocating Elizabeth until she ceased to show signs of life. The trio then proceeded to stage a macabre scene, binding Elizabeth's lifeless body, taping her mouth shut, and placing her in the trunk of her own car, concocting a kidnapping narrative. Alida, maintaining her facade, dispatched another guard under the pretext of retrieving medication, allowing their accomplice to drive off the property with Elizabeth's body. Later, Alita released a terrified Maria, falsely claiming that she and her mother had reconciled after a quarrel and that Elizabeth had retired to bed. This fabricated tale of kidnapping set off a frantic search for the missing woman, with the morning unfolding as usual, the maid preparing breakfast unaware of the sinister events. However, Alita's deception continued as she arrived at her mother's workplace, seeking assistance from Jessica Hippo, Elizabeth's best friend and accountant. Tearfully, she reported her mother's disappearance and recounted receiving strange, threatening ransom calls. In response, the accountant swiftly took action, blocking the accounts to prevent further tampering. Upon discovering the incident, Jessica Hippo promptly reported the intrusion to the police and briefly left the office. Upon her return, she found the office in disarray, indicating a search for something. Subsequently, it was revealed that Elizabeth's will, a detail Alita had overheard the day prior, 
was missing. Oozing a stolen key and a copiate will, Alida also absconded with cash from her mother's safe. Police arrived to inspect the house, interviewing Elizabeth's daughter and office staff. However, no valuable leads emerged, as Vasquez was deemed to have no known enemies or threats. Initially, the prevailing theory centered on a ransom kidnapping, awaiting further instructions and demands from the perpetrators. The following day, authorities made a terrifying discovery. Elizabeth's abandoned car in a vacant lot outside town. Inside the trunk lay her lifeless body, bearing signs of severe beatings, head trauma, and evidence of attempted restraint. Forensic analysis indicated a struggle, with blood and epithelial particles beneath Elizabeth's nails, suggesting resistance. With the discovery of blood evidence, suspicions turned toward Alita. Despite initially presenting as a grief-stricken daughter, Alita's demeanor shifted during interrogation, displaying a disconcerting calmness and even cold-bloodedness. Her responses were inconsistent, contradicting her earlier statements, raising further suspicions among investigators. When the police decided to investigate the calls purportedly made by the kidnappers and submitted a request to the cell phone company, they discovered that Alita hadn't received any such calls. Additionally, records revealed that in the days surrounding her mother's disappearance, Alita had maintained frequent contact with Fernando Gonzalez, prompting authorities to question him. However, Fernando either adamantly professed his innocence or chose to remain silent. In light of this evidence, and with the assistance of Elizabeth's maternal grandparents, who took charge of her funeral arrangements, investigators moved forward with an arrest. Meanwhile, Elizabeth, seemingly indifferent to her mother's demise, focused solely on extricating herself from the situation and preserving her finances. Desperate, she reached out to her father, tearfully asserting her innocence and seeking assistance. He cautioned her to be cautious with her words and assured her of his commitment to resolving the situation, despite already being aware of the circumstances. He was acutely aware of the perpetrator behind the crime, yet hesitated to see his daughter face imprisonment. Doing so would not only tarnish Alida's reputation, but also cast a shadow of shame upon Alejandro, who held the esteemed positions of Justice of the Peace and President of the Supreme Court, commanding great respect and influence. Meanwhile, forensic findings unequivocally linked the blood and skin particles found beneath the deceased's fingernails to Elida. Despite her attempts to justify the evidence by citing a brief quarrel, followed by reconciliation with her mother. Her explanations were met with skepticism. Further examination of Elizabeth's room, aided by specialized equipment, uncovered wiped traces of blood throughout the house, including in Alida's quarters, despite her efforts to conceal the evidence. Alida's narrative of an evening argument followed by her mother's purported early departure for work the next morning, swiftly crumbled under scrutiny. Her contradictory statements, initially denying entry into her mother's room, then recollecting otherwise, only weakened her credibility. Moreover, the fabricated ransom calls attributed to the kidnappers were exposed as Alita's handiwork. A pivotal turn in the investigation came with the testimony of the maid, Maria Chalen. She recounted how Alida had confined her to a room on the night of the crime, from where she heard Elizabeth's harrowing screams, providing crucial evidence to incriminate Alita. Despite hearing the sounds of struggle, Maria Chalen was unable to intervene that night. Subsequently, she never encountered her employer again. Alida insisted that her mother was merely at work early, portraying an image of normalcy. However, these assertions culminated in the arrest of Alida and her boyfriend, marking the beginning of a legal battle over the inheritance. Alida was apprehended at her mother's residence, while her boyfriend was detained shortly afterward at an entertainment venue. The following day, Jorge was also arrested, betrayed by Fernando, who sought to deflect blame onto him. Notably, Fernando, hoping for leniency, cooperated with the investigation, becoming the first to testify. 
Meanwhile, Alejandro spared no expense in hearing top-tier legal representation for his daughter. However, realizing the gravity of her situation, he also strategized to secure Vasquez's inheritance for himself. Claiming that he and Elizabeth had never formally divorced, he sought to capitalize on the absence of the will. Concurrently, Ernesto Vasquez, Alida's grandfather, visited her in prison, grappling with disbelief over her involvement in the heinous act. Alida's response to her grandfather's visit was marked by arrogance and disrespect, exacerbating his distress. Sadly, this encounter precipitated a fatal heart attack, from which he never recovered, passing away six months later. Despite efforts by the Vasquez family to validate the existence of the missing will, its disappearance from Elizabeth's office and the notary's records, seemingly orchestrated by Alejandro, presented insurmountable obstacles. All records pertaining to the couple's divorce mysteriously vanished, granting Alejandro grounds to assert his rights over the deceased's estate. Despite attempts by Alita, Fernando, and Jorge to shift blame onto each other, the investigation meticulously reconstructed the events of the fatal evening, pinpointing the precise roles of each participant. Evidence established a deliberate conspiracy orchestrated by the trio, exacerbating their culpability. Maria's testimony played a pivotal role in the trial, detailing Alejandro's attempts to coerce her into providing false testimony. In May 2012, the court found all three defendants guilty. While the prosecutor initially sought 30-year sentences for each participant, Fernando and Jorge, who confessed, received 28-year terms. Alida, however, portrayed herself as a victim and alleged that relatives on her mother's side orchestrated the crime to seize Elizabeth's assets. Efforts to depict Alida as mentally unfit and manipulated by criminals were futile. Alejandro's strategy to institutionalize her, thereby disqualifying her from inheriting Elizabeth's estate, was rejected. In December 2012, Alita received the maximum sentence of 30 years in prison, where she and her accomplices remain incarcerated. As for the disputed inheritance, Alejandro's death in the spring of 2021 left the matter unresolved. The Vasquez family now endeavors to exclude Alida from the list of claimants, citing her conviction for murder. Maria Moila, Elizabeth's mother, emerges as the primary claimant. Thank you for watching. Subscribe to the channel and remember to hit the bell for more compelling stories ahead.